Welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal, season two. You can learn more about our topics and speakers by joining our Environmental Fridays Facebook group. This series is brought to you by Best Early, the Benton Spirit Community Newspaper, Andrews University Community Engagement Council, GC Scored, Every Piece Matters. Introducing your host, Dr. Desmond Hartwell Murray, and this week's co-host, Dr. Marlene Murray. Sheriff Winchester. This week on Environmental Fridays, we'll be hearing from Nadira Mathura, Kelly Minette Kameo. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to season two of Environmental Fridays. It is personal. Today is a very special Environmental Fridays for me. Um, we are going to be coming live from Tobago. Well, my co-host, presenters, I'm here in Michigan being jealous. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, Tobago, part of the reason why it's uh, very special to me, that's where my dad is from. And uh, before I came to the United States, to pursue undergraduate studies. I uh, taught for one year at Hammond's SDA in Scarborough, Tobago. So Tobago is very dear to me. Um, we want to also uh, mention that our website is now up and um, there is the link to it. We could send the link and I think I've sent it in, in notifications about the, um, the, the episode. Uh, so you could, be, you could get it there and you could uh, check out our website for a lot more information. It's actually a pretty cool website. My co-host today, as I started mentioning, uh, both from Tobago and in Tobago at this very moment. It's very cool. Uh, I'll first begin by introducing Ms. Sharifa Winchester. She is actually from Buku and she knows the offices of our presenters. Uh, she was born and raised in Buku, a fishing village there in Tobago. Um, she is currently pursuing a bachelor's of education in, uh, in particular primary education at the University of Southern Caribbean on the Tobago uh, campus. While doing that, she's also the senior manager at her family owned company. And as a lifelong resident of Buku, she is a full supporter of the work that they are doing in regards to research, conservation, and the education of individuals on the marine environment of Tobago. So welcome again, Sharifa, to Environmental Fridays, episode 11. Thank you My, for having me. OK, you're welcome. My other co-host is my cousin. I'm just going to be you know, out there with that. And she is uh, Dr. Molly Murray. Uh, she's professor of biology at Andrews University. She received her PhD in molecular biology at Wayne State University, which I also am an alumni of in Detroit, Michigan. And she's been here at Andrews for 21 years. She teaches genetics, anatomy and physiology, microbiology, human biology, and histology. She's a member of the Genetic Society of America. And her, one of her passions in terms of research is in the area of bipolar disorder. And I believe you've been doing this research, looking into it since um, your graduate or postgraduate work. Uh, graduate, since graduate Grad school. Since graduate yeah. school. <laughs> and I have been excited to join her in this. And so we have a ongoing collaboration on bipolar disorder. And in addition to um, her professional interests, 
uh, Marlene, Dr. Murray, enjoys traveling, hiking, living a very balanced life. And that's why she is in Tobago <laughs> and I'm in Hart. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm going to play you a little video, Marlene, of Marlene in Charlottesville. <laughs> So that's where Marlene is. <laughs> so thank you to Marlene, Dr. Murray, for being part of Environmental Fridays today. And thank you for having me. No problem. You're welcome. So um, I normally go through a number of slides. I'm going to make this short so that we spend more time on the presentation. Um, the original idea for uh, Environmental Fridays came from trying to contextualize, make chemistry real for my students at the high school level and using the environment and environmental issues to do that. Um, I will go forward and have um, Sharifa and I will do the introductions now. So I'll start with um, Kelly. So Ms. Kelly Manet Kamajo, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, you are. Okay, she's one of the directors at the uh, Buku Reef Trust. And she's a graduate of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. She has a master's um, in, in management of tropical environments and a bachelor's in biology and environmental and natural resources management. And so she's um, very much involved in the education sphere. So she does a lot of outreach and education for um, secondary students um, in Trinidad and Tobago. She was involved in the inception, for example, of Neher's Caribbean Youth Science Forum. And for 15 years, um, she's been in this sphere looking at environmental science, marine, sustainable, ecotourism. So she's well qualified to talk to us about this. Uh, she's an associate member with the NGO CEP. Seas, sepsis, I think that's correct. Species. Species. Species, species sorry. <laughs> and um, so it's a, it's a privilege to have her here to talk to us about the sustainable um, use of the marine environment, sustainable ecotourism in Tobago. So um, Sharifa, you could go ahead and introduce our other guest speaker. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, Ms. Nad Nadira Matura, she's currently part of the board of directors of the Book Reef Trust. She is a multidisciplinary professional with a passion for promoting sustainable development agendas in both in the Caribbean. She holds a degree in both natural sciences and engineering with minor academic pursuits in the field of management. She has over 15 years of experience working both in the energy industry, academia and research. She is a published peer reviewed, international peer reviewed journalist and she has received international awards, including the Emerging Leaders in, a, in the Americas program and the Institution of Civil Engineers Young Professional. She has a positive attitude. She is logistically inclined. She has a lot of leadership skills and it has allowed her to add to the Boko Reef Trust outstanding portfolio in the research, education and conservation. Um, sector. So good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for having us here today. It is indeed our pleasure. So um, my name is Kelly, as you would have heard before, and I'm just going to give you 
a brief history of the Booker Reef Trust as we start talking about an integrated approach to sustainable ecotourism on the island of Tobago. So we'll just take a look at Booker Reef Trust and what we do. The trust was established in 1999 and the vision of the Booker Reef Trust is a world in which the marine environments of tropical islands is conserved for future generations while maximizing present opportunities for sustainable sorry, for sustainable livelihoods that enhance the quality of human life. And our mission is to actively work in the Caribbean to develop the capacity in the area of tropical marine sciences that enables our people to protect the marine environment while ensuring sustainable use of the region's aquatic resources. So the Boca Reef Trust, we operate on three pillars and that would be research, education, and conservation. Because we believe that the research and the education feeds into the, con the conversation of conservation and the actions that follow. So a little bit on Trinidad and Tobago, we are a twin island republic, and we are located in the southeastern portion of the Caribbean archipelago. And Tobago is actually about 32 kilometers northeast of Trinidad with an area of 300 kilometers squared. Our population is about 60,874 60, persons and we do have a dominant mountain running about two thirds the length of the island and that's parallel to the coastline. So we're gonna hear a little bit about our main ridge in a bit. Um, the southwestern end of the island is predominantly um, coralline limestone and the northeastern end is actually a bit more um, volcanic in terms of the history and the evolution of the island. So when we speak about Trinidad and Tobago and sustainable ecotourism, the first thing we need to understand is our diverse marine and terrestrial resources that we do possess in Tobago. So I have a few slides here that will make some of y'all jealous to be back in Tobago, but this is where we live. We can actually say we live here and we are proud to live here. So the first resource that we're gonna look at is our coral reef ecosystem. And very briefly, a coral reef ecosystem would be one that is a geological structure made up of limestone or calcium carbonate and built by living organisms called polyps. So corals are alive. And these polyps function and live together in what we call colonies. So our coral reefs, next slide require optimum conditions for growth that can only be found in the tropical regions where they exist. So they require warm temperatures, they need sunlight because of this symbiotic relationship between the zooxanthellae that exist in the skin of the polyp and the photosynthesizers. The polyps require shallow water, clear water to allow enough sunlight to penetrate and moderate wave action to remove sediment that can actually have a detrimental, detrimental effect on the polyps if the sediment is allowed to settle and actually suffocate the polyps. Next slide. So this is basically the regions of the world where we do find our coral reefs in the tropical regions where these conditions tend to be optimal for their growth and successful um, reproduction. Next slide. All right. So on this slide, we have the location of the many different reefs we have in Tobago. And if we take a look, we realize most of our reefs are found on the Caribbean sea side of the island as opposed to the Atlantic Ocean side. And this is because the Caribbean sea side of the island tends to be a bit more sheltered and protected from the heavy wave action we would normally find on the Atlantic side. So Tobago, we do have many coral reef ecosystems that 
we can utilize in terms of our sustainable tourism product to allow visitors to come and experience what we see here on a daily basis. Okay, next slide. So just a little glimpse of a few of the reefs in Tobago. We have the Speyside Reef in Little Tobago. We have the largest brain coral. Um, that's where the divers are here. So we can actually boast of having the largest brain coral in the Western Hemisphere, located at Speyside. And there are many other reefs that we can explore. One of the slides, the previous slide, actually has a link that um, the NGO species would have worked on. So when we click on Let's Tour, we can actually go to another web page. We can maybe try and do it. Go to another web page, which is open to the public domain, and virtually dive these coral reefs in Tobago and get a 360 degree view of the reefs that you have here on the map. So I don't know if it's opening. Maybe we can do one example of it. Yeah, Google it is still loading to me. All right, so maybe what we can do, we can maybe come back to the Google Earth and just explore if we have a bit of time, but we can make the presentation available as well and the link so that participants are free to explore and see our reefs in Tobago. All right? Oh, we're in, we're in. Okay, nice. Any particular beer you'd like to look at, Kelly? Um, you can choose any one. Maybe Coral Garden. Coral Garden. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right, so this um, this album that was designed and worked on by Species in addition to Maritime Collection, it is basically an educational tool that can be used by anyone in the world. And we can explore the reefs, we can see the organisms, the fish, the corals that we do have. And it gives us, well, not a real time view, but just a glimpse of what we do have over here in Tobago. All right, so this is Coral Gardens and you'll see some of the different species of corals that we do have here. The star coral, the fire coral, and some of these species of fish that we have inhabiting our reefs. Mm -hmm. All right. So we make this link available so that it can be explored. Um, at your leisure when you choose to take a dive into our oceans. Okay. <laughs> All right, so our coral reefs are famous, but the most famous one in Tobago is the Buku Reef. And it is the largest fringing reef in Tobago, and it's actually on its way to becoming a smaller barrier reef. So the Buku Reef is famous because of its depth, it's not very deep and as a result, we have a lot of tourism based activities taking place on this reef because there is a wealth of information located right there in Buku where visitors can actually see the corals, the reefs and also explore the mangrove ecosystem that is closely associated with it. So we do have reef tour operators, divers, snorkelers, kayakers coming across just to be a part of what the Buku Reef has to offer. Next slide. All right, so we'll take a quick look into the importance of coral reefs in Tobago. And basically we have several benefits of having these coral reefs. Um, the important nursery grounds and habitats to a variety of species, all of which we find right here in Tobago. French angelfish, the red cushion starfish, feather duster worms, and the picture up above is the elkhorn coral. Our tourism and recreation um, aspect that we, sorry, benefit that we gather from the reef is due to the fact that reefs generate approximately $130 million for Tobago and this was noted in the World Resource Institute report that was done in 2006. So 
This is a major income generator for Tobago. And as we note, the income comes in because we have a resource. If we don't have the resource, then that breaks the flow of this income coming in. And we need to look at ways in which we can utilize it, but also conserve it for future generations. All right, so this is the tourism and recreation and income-based um, benefit. Reefs are also important for food. So our coral reefs actually contribute to about 1.3 million in fisheries globally. And we have here some of our young persons involved in the traditional method of catching fish in Tobago, which is seine pulling. And we have also a variety of species that can be found on the reef, as well as those that utilize the reef as a nursery ground and then eventually end up in our food chain um, as a source of protein in Tobago. So next slide. Our reefs are important for providing sand and building land over a period of time. So as said before, the southwestern end of Tobago is an ancient coral reef and it is basically major, um, made of limestone the sand on our beaches, we have a major contributing factor from the erosion and the natural breakdown of the coral reef particles as the tide influences the sediment formation. Next slide. All right, so these are images we have of the no, Man, of no man's land in Buku. And this is also a good reminder of how our coral reefs actually protect from erosion and storm damage. It protects the land and it wards off the impacts of the tide as it comes in on a daily basis. Our coral reefs create nice, safe, calm harbors where boats can dock. And we have a lot of these little bays and inlets all around Tobago. Next slide. So now that we have explored our coral reef um, resource, let's take a quick look at our wetlands and mangroves. So our wetlands are basically areas of marsh, fen, peatland, or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is either static or flowing, fresh, brackish, or salt. And it includes areas of marine water to a depth at which the low tide does not exceed six meters. So coral reefs are actually considered wetlands in some instances where it meets this depth requirement. Um, it's an area of land that is subject to permanent or seasonal or tidal inundation, which supports emergent vegetation. And the emergent vegetation we're going to take a quick look at would be the mangal. So this is a unique intertidal coastal wetland ecosystem, and it is found in sheltered tropical and subtropical shores, closely associated with our coral reef ecosystems as well. The plants in the mangal will be our mangroves. And because of the periodic wet and dry tidal inputs, we have waterlogged soil fluctuating salinity, and alternating aerobic and anaerobic conditions, which promotes anoxic soil, which is basically low in oxygen. So we also see um, fluctuations in the temperature at mangrove ecosystems. Next slide. So our mangroves, very briefly, the diverse group of trees and shrubs that live in the coastal intertidal zone, and we will note them by their dense tangle of prop roots. And these usually elevate the trees above the water and allow them to tolerate the rise and fall of the tides on a daily basis. The mangroves that we have um, basically have many functions and benefits to our ecosystems. The roots tend to slow down the movement of the tidal waters so that the sediment is able to settle out and build the muddy bottom. And we also have, as I said before, low oxygen in the soil. So those are some characteristics of our mangrove um, that we would see in Tobago. 
this map just gives a general layout of some of our mangrove um some of our wetlands in tobago and uh, the next slide that comes will show you a study that was done in 2007 where it estimated the coverage of the mangroves at 222.9 hectares but it only took into account 11 of those sites so we do have a lot of impacts and developments taking place where we are losing mangrove ecosystems and trying to actually work with conserving what we do have in Tobago still. All right, so we have some at Buku, Kilgwen, all the way up to Black Rock in Tobago. So our mangrove species, we have 80 different species around the world. Seven are found in Trinidad and four are found in Tobago. So the four in Tobago will be the red mangrove, Rhizophora mango, the black mangrove, Avicennia geminans, the white mangrove, Laguncularia rismosa, and the buttonwood mangrove, Conocarpus erectus. So the next few slides will just show you an image of what these mangrove plants do look like so we can spot them when we actually visit our wetlands. All right, so this is the red mangrove, and then we have the black mangrove, which does not have the characteristic prop roots, but in place it has these pencil-like projections called pneumatophores, which are the breathing roots that allows the mangrove to survive in the tidal fluctuations. The next slide, we will have the white mangrove. So these actually are zoned and they go from plants submerged in water partially into plants that are more land-based. So the white mangrove does have some tidal influence. However, it is more land-based as compared to the black and the red mangrove. And the last slide, we will see the Conocarpus erectus or the buttonwood, which tends to be used more as ornamental plants in horticulture. And this is because these are also known locally as silver mangrove. All right, so these are more land-based as compared to the other three species that we identified earlier. So our mangroves, very quickly, we look at the benefits. We have provisioning services. So we gather a lot of our um, resources, food, from the mangroves. We have crabs, oysters, birds, wildlife, and we can also gather fiber and fuel for cooking, um, cooking oil and coal in mangrove ecosystems. We also have medicines and herbal teas that we can gather from mangrove ecosystems. And there are goods that can be harvested. So we have touch, timber and furniture, paper, glue, tannins and dyes. Also, mangroves provide regulating services. So our mangroves are very important in terms of climate regulation when we speak about greenhouse gases and the ability to store carbon and this greenhouse gas, which would then impact the climate. We also have water regulation where the roots of the mangroves slow down the runoff of fresh water entering our marine ecosystems. And this now has an impact on our coastal and coral reef environment. So mangroves serve a very good purpose here. This little video shows us erosion regulation and it shows us a model where the actual presence of the mangrove protects and stabilizes the coastline by reducing the impact of the waves as it heads towards land. Right, so we can actually see the water that is closer to the land has very little movement as compared to the water that is actually making contact with the plants at the start of the coastline. So our mangroves have regulating services and they also help in regulating natural hazards as they serve as wind breaks along the shoreline. They absorb nutrients that we get when the wastewater comes off the land runoff 
it's absorbed before that nutrient actually gets to our coral reef ecosystems. Mangroves provide supporting services. So we have soil formation as the sediment is trapped by the soil, sorry, by the roots. It builds land as the sediment forms layers. And we also have nutrient cycling taking place in our mangrove ecosystem. So it is one of the most productive natural ecosystems in the world where we have the detrital food chain, meaning a lot of decomposition taking place in the mangrove ecosystems, making it very productive. Linkages with neighboring ecosystems. So as I mentioned before, our mangroves and wetlands tend to be associated with our coral reef ecosystems and seagrass beds. And this is very evident in the Buku Reef era. It's a beautiful example of these linkages existing in tandem with each other in one particular area. Our mangroves also provide supporting services. So we have breathing and nursery grounds and habitat grounds for a variety of organisms. All these images were captured in our Bonacord Lagoon. So the Boca Reef Bonacord Lagoon complex so we have the Cook's tree boa, the iguana, the tree crab, and the golden orb spider. So these are only a few of what we see every time we take a trip out to that reef and the mangrove ecosystem. Our cultural services, recreation, bird watching. So we do have a lot of visitors coming over to Tobago just to see the birds and the organisms present in our mangrove ecosystems. So it's a very good source of income in terms of our ecotourism product, where bird watching and tour guides actually utilize this um, resource. It has aesthetic and spiritual value as well. So some of our different religious groups utilize mangroves for whether it's prayers or different religious practices and if you choose the right spot it's one of the best places to go to just be silent and to actually appreciate nature so one of the things that we do at the Boca Reef Trust we utilize the mangrove ecosystems and this is the boardwalk at the Magdalena Hotel it is used for education and research. So these images show an example of our young persons getting familiar and learning about our mangrove ecosystems by taking tours through the ecosystem and appreciating the real value of what our wetlands and our mangroves have to offer. So we took a look at mangroves and wetlands we took a look at our coral reefs and we're gonna jump very quickly into our seagrasses. So we do have seagrass beds associated with our coral reef ecosystem and the wetlands in Buku Bonacord complex. So our seagrasses are flowering plants that live underwater and they need enough light and nutrients to grow. They usually form tiny flowers, fruits and seeds and they reproduce by pollination. These are not considered seaweeds, there's a difference. So the next slide will show us the different parts of the seagrasses very briefly, the leaf blade, the shoot, the rhizomes, and the roots. So our seagrasses, we have different species found in Tobago. So next slide. Right, so in Trinidad and Tobago, we have six species. Um, but in Tobago, these three species are what we find specifically in Tobago. The turtle grass on the top right hand side, the manatee grass and shoal grass. So in the Bonacord Lagoon and the Book Reef Complex, we do have a large patch of turtle grass. And this is also very beneficial. Um, next slide, please. This is also beneficial to the organisms that utilize this habitat. So this is a map of the Buka Reef habitats that we do find there. And the turtle grass and manatee grass 
are found in some locations. So that's the brown, brown spotches you will see. But we also have a large area of turtle grass, which would be the, the green patches that you see on this habitat map. So globally, our sea grasses tend to be shrinking. However, in the Booker Reef, we do have a situation where we actually have the seagrass beds expanding. So that is a good thing. And we do have some conflicts at times with our tour operators and the use of the Buka Reef Nylon Pool, which is a big area of white sand, well, clean white sand, clear area where visitors come to bathe, but our seagrasses have been encroaching in this area. So this is one of the issues we are looking at now in terms of the management of the nylon pool and the seagrass beds to ensure that there's a, a sustainable balance in terms of the visitors that come to the area as well as maintaining that seagrass population in the nylon pool. Next slide. So seagrasses, they are very important. They are a nursery and habitat for many animals. So fish like snappers, grunts. We have the queen conch, crabs, lobsters, shrimp, sea urchins, starfish, brittle stars. All of these organisms utilize sea grass beds for habitats and nursery grounds. Additionally, they serve as a direct source of food for other organisms, so the live sea grasses are consumed by um, sea turtles. We also have it being consumed by sea urchins, fish, and in areas such as in Trinidad and maybe in our Caribbean islands like Venezuela, where we do have the manatee population, they are consumed by these organisms. Um, the epiphytes on the seagrass blades, so we have many fish species consuming the little epiphytes that grow on the blades. And indirectly, it's a food source um, within the detrital the food chain. So the decomposition that takes place also provides food for invertebrates, fish, and birds, and the plankton that we do have in the marine environment. Next slide. Our seagrasses stabilize the sediment, and it reduces any sediment from the erosion of the coastline from going further into our coral reef ecosystems. So in doing so, it also helps improve the water quality by reducing the sediment deposition, as well as absorbing the excess organic nutrients that could cause eutrophication or algal blooms in our seagrass beds, as well as on the coral reef ecosystems. So another example of our resources here in Tobago, we have forests and watersheds. So when we speak about our forests and watersheds, the first thing that comes to mind for most of us in Tobago is the Main Ridge Forest Reserve. So we're gonna chat about the Main Ridge in a few minutes, but first let's see what is a watershed. It's basically an area where all the water or precipitation, sediment and materials will flow to the same outlet, whether it's a pond, a river, a wetland, or the ocean. So the watersheds are systems that link the land, water, and all living organisms within the boundaries. When we consider watersheds, we have to also look at the water that's generated here being available for domestic, agricultural, industrial, and in this video, recreational use. So a lot of visitors come to So in a bid to boost our um, ecotourism product, we believe that we do have our young persons and we get them involved in learning about it and truly appreciating it in order to serve the environment later on when they become the policy makers and the decision makers in Tobago. 
So our watersheds, we have many livelihoods that depend on healthy watersheds in order to sustain them. So for example, our fisher folk lower down in the watershed, our farmers, guest houses, many ecotourism, eco resorts that we have in Tobago, um, the reef to operators, all of these are stakeholders that rely on healthy watersheds to sustain their livelihoods and the income for Tobago. Next slide. All right. So basically, any activity that takes place within the watershed affects the natural ecosystems. So we have drains, streams and rivers picking up eroded soil, chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides and animal and human waste. And it passes along to plants and animals and possibly to humans. So as a result of this, we do have to ensure that we put measures in place to keep our watersheds healthy. Our watersheds in Tobago, the main forest that we will talk about is the main ridge um, forest reserve. And again, Tobago is on the map. We can boast that it's one of the oldest protected forest reserves established in 1734 in the world. So we actually hold that title of having this forest reserve that has been established since 1734. Now, the main range forest reserve is actually part of the Hillsborough watershed. And we have major river systems in Richmond, Goldsboro, and Hillsborough. So those rivers lead to the different watersheds located around Tobago. And the rivers directly support the, flight, the phytoplankton, fish, crabs, crayfish, and a variety of organisms that make their homes in these rivers and watersheds. Next slide. So the watersheds in Tobago, we have 14 hydrometric areas, nine in Trinidad and five in Tobago. And one hydrometric area is um, basically comprises a number of watersheds. So on the next slide, we will see that in Tobago, we actually have 15 watersheds and a case study, well, a project was done in the Colon watershed to highlight it as one of the areas we can look at the ridge to reef management of the area for further work in terms of ecotourism and conservation and restoration activities. So just looking at the Colon watershed, it encompasses the different villages of Mary's Hill, Annisvale, Adelphi, and Mason Hall, Mariah, and Runnymede. And it covers an area of 7,556 acres. It's the fourth largest watershed in Tobago, and it empties into the Caribbean Sea. This watershed actually has a balance of different ecosystems, including two wetlands and three reef sites closely associated with the Colon watershed. The benefits that were um, observed in the Colon watershed on the next slide will include preventing flooding. So the wetlands helped absorb the excess water and we have associated vegetation providing habitats for many organisms and stabilize the land as well. And the three reefs provided sand for beaches, natural breakwaters and reduced coastal erosion and is also extremely economically valuable to the ecotourism product and the fishing industries in Tobago. So this is a little example of our young persons again, exploring our main ridge eco, sorry, our main ridge um, forest reserve as part of the Hillsborough watershed. Right, so here we have our tour guides 
and our tour guiding services in the Main Ridge Forest Reserve. Again, another source of income as well as supporting our ecotourism product in Tobago. Okay, so next slide. All right. So as we have heard, all of Tobago's diverse ecosystems are interconnected and we can better understand it in the ridge to reef concept where we understand that mangroves, seagrass beds, coral reef ecosystems are all working in tandem with each other to maintain healthy coastal ecosystems and coastal zones. So when we consider the management of it and the use of these resources, we cannot consider it in isolation. The next slide will show us, basically when we look at management, we have to consider, next slide, the ridge to reef concept. So this ridge to reef concept is also important when we look at our ecotourism product in Tobago because we cannot consider it in isolation. Each ecosystem has an impact on the other. Okay, next slide. So in Tobago, we have many threats to our diverse ecosystems. Our coral reefs undergo many threats, including natural issues that they face, such as hurricanes, storms, predators. We have anthropogenic threats as well, such as plastics, litter, pollution, reef walking, anchors being dropped on the reef, clearing of land during construction, and sewage and wastewater. So what we'll take a look at very quickly will be the threats that exist um, facing all our resources that we pointed out here. So this is sewage and wastewater actually being one of the major issues that our coral reefs face when the water is not treated efficiently, but it causes eutrophication where the algae overgrows the corals and suffocate them. Next slide. Reef walking. So one of the side effects of our visitors coming to Tobago if proper rules and regulations are not put in place and enforced, we have situations where reef walking takes place. And reef walking prevents the smaller corals from growing. And when boats actually visit the Buku Reef and this image on top is Nylon Pool, next slide, we have anchors being dropped and these actually break the live corals. So in order to have our sustainable ecotourism, we must also put things in place, put measures in place to avoid situations like this. Next slide. Um, unplanned or inefficiently planned developments, especially during rainy season, result in sedimentation and runoff from the land eventually entering our coastal areas. And this image below is the old jetty, well, the old um, boardwalk in Buku. We had sedimentation a good few years ago, as well as the Lansumi Bloody Bay Link Road up on top, where the road was being constructed. And because certain measures were not put in place, we had the impacts being seen in our coastal areas. Next slide. So these are some of the images of the ecological degradation that we had. Next slide. Unsustainable fishing. If we don't regulate our fisheries, we do have issues in terms of the population of our species declining rapidly. Next slide. Well, this is one of the issues that we see regularly, marine debris and solid waste pollution. So the image to the bottom, right is not in Tobago, but it highlights one of the more global issues that we are facing and we are not spared from it right here in Tobago. So marine debris is one of our major challenges. And of course, global warming and climate change. So rising global temperatures and climate change stresses our corals and as a result, they appear white and we see what is called coral bleaching. So bleaching has been observed and uh, it has been observed, next slide, in 
coral reefs all over the world, also in Trinidad and Tobago. So it is estimated that we have about 0.2% of the ocean being coral reefs. And the coral reefs are globally disappearing at an alarming rate. So 75% of the world's coral reefs are threatened by global pressures. And if it's not checked by the year 2030, we expect to see um, about 90% of our reefs actually being threatened. Next slide. Our mangroves, these are traditionally used as dumping grounds and landfills. And we have issues with reclamation of the land for building hotels, marinas, harbors, clearing vegetation, and actually changing the hydrological flow of water through the mangroves and the pollution by domestic effluent. Again, climate change and sea level rise is another threat to mangroves, as well as unsustainable harvesting methods and overexploitation, as well as invasive species and diseases. Our seagrass beds, um, we do have discussions, again, associated with um, the challenges of balancing our ecotourism as well as the resources where we have plans being discussed to maybe remove some of the seagrass beds physically. And then there are cases where the boats will actually remove it accidentally when they place the anchor or when the propellers pass, it may damage depending on the depth of the water. So our anthropogenic um, impacts will include suspended particles in the water being increased and increased levels of nutrients in the water as well. On the other side, we do have threats also taking place um, with regard to coastal erosion. So that suspended matter flows down, it suffocates the plants and it reduces the growth. We also have, next slide. Right, so that physical removal and unsustainable fishing also impacts our resources of seagrass beds. Next slide. And the effluent, if it's not treated efficiently, it enters the water and serves to promote algal growth and blooms. So this in turn impacts the growth of the seagrasses. Our forests and watersheds, we have many changes that occur in the watersheds because of human impacts such as forest fires, urbanization, deforestation, quarrying, and agriculture. On the other slide, we will see that these activities, such as illegal dumping of garbage and oil appliances, sewage and toxic chemical pollution, do also impact our watersheds and our forested areas. Our forest fires and again, on or inefficiently planned construction leads to threats on our forest and watershed ecosystems. So if we do not have good farming practices, the soil conservation methods and clearing of the hillsides, we end up with that sediment going straight into our coral reefs and seagrass beds. Next slide. All right. So again, it was estimated in a 2001 national report that Tobago has at least 15% of topsoil being lost through inappropriate land use. So we do have threats and issues facing our watersheds, our coral reefs, our seagrass beds. But once we are able to manage these threats through proper conservation activities and awareness and education, we can now change the tide and change the way that we view our resources. Next slide. So our conservation methods that can actually help with our ecotourism product, we can have community tourism. So in Tobago, we have the Castara Tourism Development Association, and this community has taken the lead in practicing ecotourism. And they 
aim to preserve the environment while promoting our local culture through strong community participation. So this community has taken it upon themselves to actually ban the use of styrofoam and plastic bags within the community, even though it has been um, spoken about in Trinidad and Tobago, but we do have a lull in that plan and actually implementing it. But Castara Tourism Development Association, they have pioneered that move to actually make Castara one of the ecotourism um, case studies that we can look at very proudly. So their marketing is focused on repeat customers and the promotion of the village's green areas and cultural practices. Next slide. We have other organizations such as ERIC, the Environmental Research Institute of Charlottesville. Um, they are engaged in coral gardening and a reef restoration program. And again, we can have our ecotourism product encompassing education. So we can have more like educational tourism where visitors can come and actually participate in these conservation activities. Um, the Turtle Village Trust and SOS, Save or Sea Turtles, other organizations in Tobago um, that are active in terms of the protection and conservation of our sea turtles on our coast. And visitors, as well as our locals and community members, can get involved in this conservation of our turtles, which again is an income generator for Tobago. We very recently had international certification being conducted with the Green Organ uh, sorry, Green TNT, the organization that is involved in the International Blue Flag Certification Program. So our tour operators in Tobago very recently completed their first set of um, biodiversity tra training with us, where they are now going to be the pioneers going out there, putting practices in place where we can encourage our visitors and users of our natural resources, the coral reefs, the wetlands, to appreciate it and sustainably use it so that it is able to be around for future generations. Next slide. Um, on the government level, we have funding from the FAO and there is funding to improve the forest and protected areas management in Trinidad and Tobago. And this encompasses the Main Ridge Forest Reserve and the Northeast Tobago Marine Protected Area. So the Northeast Tobago Marine Protected Area focuses on making the Northeastern end of Tobago also recognized and legally protected by law, just the way, just in a similar way that the Boca Reef is a marine protected area. Um, we, I believe you all had a speaker as well on the Adopt a River program. And these initiatives not only speak to developing our tourism product in a sustainable way by encomp um, encompassing and involving our communities and corporate entities so that we can now look at that holistic approach of managing the ridge to reef in a sustainable way. Next slide. And here we have some of the measures that the Book Reef Trust has actually been involved with over the years. You can see it on our web page. Um, we have the IWCAM project, which was the Integrated Watershed and Coastal Areas Management Project. We did the Tobago Coastal Ecosystems Mapping Project, Sustainable Seafood Project, and at one point, we actually had sea moss cultivation and processing. So all of these programs not only sought to identify um, our natural resources, but also in some cases actually value the ecosystems that we do have. We also had programs that would have put measures in place to conserve our natural environment like the reef demarcation boys. So when you get a chance, we can actually visit our Book of Reef Trust website and see some of the work that we have done in order to conserve, protect, and make our tourism product something worth fighting for. Next slide. 
One of the areas that we are most proud of in Book Reef Trust is our CSUN and Science program. And this is a vacation program that's an offshoot of our education program. Next slide. Building environmental awareness of coastal habitats, that's beach, where we basically provide an opportunity for our students locally as well as internationally to learn about the marine environment and coastal um, environment and have a first-hand experience in the techniques of sampling, ecology, biology, fisheries management, so that they can have a better appreciation and we can have stewards of the marine environment coming up into our next generation. Next slide. So when we speak about eco, um, sustainable ecotourism, we know that our tourism industry is one or was one of the fastest and largest growing industries in the world. And pre-COVID, the global travel and tourism increased by 3.5%. After COVID, we now are looking at a recovery of this tourism and global travel. It is an important source of foreign exchange and employment, especially in Tobago. Our communities and our people in Tobago are heavily dependent on our tourism product. And it is closely linked to the social, economical, sorry, economic and environmental well-being of Tobago, along with many of our developing countries. So in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, it describes tourism as a tool to increase the economic benefits to small island developing states. And the targets have highlighted the importance of sustainable tourism. So this sustainable tourism, by definition, is one which can sustain local economies without damaging the actual environment upon which it depends. So it's almost a chicken and an egg situation. Which one do you protect first in order to have it continue into our next generation? So our sustainable ecotourism can be challenging. And this would be seen where we have countries or islands especially that do not have the capacity to implement these sustainable practices or where the policies don't support it and it is limited. And then eventually we end up with negative environmental and social consequences. So we do have challenges facing our sustainable tourism product in islands, such as limited environmental resources, which we do see right here in Tobago. There is a bigger need for community involvement. But as I pointed out, Castara has basically taken the lead in showing how we can have a beautiful case study with our communities actively involved in the protection and the use of our tourism product and natural resources. Um, in some cases, our stakeholders actually feel powerless to be able to implement that change. And we do have challenges from special interest activities that kind of hamper the sustainable growth of our ecotourism product. Next slide. And finally, what we at the Booker Reef Trust would like to um, advocate for is the fact that we can have all these resources, but I think one of our most integral components of ecotourism will be our people. And our people are the ones that we need to actually invest in, in terms of environmental education, awareness and outreach in order to have a change in a mindset so that we can now actually conserve the natural environment, environment and have a better sustainable ecotourism product and customer service so that we can make Tobago return to their space on the map where we have an ecotourism product we can boast about. So. This brings us to the end of our presentation. I know we were a bit lengthy, but um, do we have any questions, comments, discussions? Okay, well, Marlene, Dr. Murray. So Marlene, Dr. Murray, are you there? Oh, yeah, I, I was muted, sorry. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you, thank you very much, Kelly and Nadira, for this awesome presentation. Uh, it has it was awesome. It was uh, informative. I've learned so much about this island that I, I was born in, <laughs> on, <laughs> that I, I had no idea. And I, I'm so relieved to hear about this, um, the Book Reef Trust and the, the tool you provided for empowering citizens to protect the island, um, the, uh, the, the tools of conservatives, uh, the conservation tools that you, you have implemented. I wasn't able to see that slide very well, but I will take a look at this presentation and, and uh, delve more into that. But I, I was blown away to know that there we have several coral reefs around the island. This is new to me. I don't know if anyone else who grew up on the island knew this. Mm. And I wanted to know if there are any plans to develop those reefs, those coral reefs, to the scale, to the level that the Buku Reef has been developed as a, a, a tourist attraction or a place that tourists can go and you know, similar to, to Buku Reef. Are there any plans for that? Mm -hmm. And what are they? Um, so at the moment, the other reef ecosystem that I think um, we are more familiar with is also the Little Tobago, the reefs associated with the islands of Little Tobago as on the northeastern end of the island. Um, that is also another ecotourism destination where we do have reef tour operators, we have the hiking on the island, bird watching. So it is something that I believe that we may have plans in place, not Book a Reef Trust as an organization, but more. Um, on the THA level, because I think very recently we would have seen the fixing of one of the jetties, so it, I think it's ongoing, that would allow visitors to once again return to the island and be able to see the brain coral, the little Tobago Island, as well as Goat Island. Um, very recently, the northeastern end of Tobago has been under, um, has been highlighted in terms of a project that is being conducted by Eric, which is Man and the Biosphere. So I am not sure exactly to what scale we are looking at developing each reef or the reef ecosystems, but the depth of the different reefs in Tobago do prove to have um, some, well, do prove to have some challenges in terms of accessing it. So Booker Reef is very shallow, so that's why we have a lot more activity taking place there. And the different reefs in Tobago may have their limitations in terms of how easy it is to access these resources. So you may actually find our scuba divers being the ones accessing the reefs around Tobago, scuba diving and snorkeling, as opposed to the reef boats and the tour operators. I am not too sure exactly how big the scale is for the plans for the development of the reefs and that tourism product, but it is one that we do have to be very careful with because if we don't have the proper policies and um, enforcements, then we will have degradation taking place. So I think the most important thing is to make sure that we do have the proper plans and policies in place first before it's actually implemented. If I might add to um, one, two conservation, two methods that are being used to promote the reefs outside of the Boko would be um, species, which is the let's store um, that we are taking you to Google Earth. What they did, the species organization, they actually were able to take us on a virtual around the island of every, they were able to map each each reef, give us some 360 degree photos of it. So in essence, we may, they may not be able to take us physically there, but they're making us more aware of what mm -hmm. is in each location and the different types of corals or sponges that we might be able to see if we take a dive there. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly sort of touched on it, the work that Eric is doing, which is also the coral restoration. So they are now trying to rehabilitate some of the corals and, and probably even do more planting of the corals to see how successful it can be. Not, and they are not in the Boca Reef area, but they are 
on the other reefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Very good to hear that because I, I see I see Len's ha um, hand, but I just wanted to add that I I see I've seen a difference uh, of the bookery from when I was a child to now. I remember it being very vibrant. And the last time I visited a few years ago, it didn't have that vibrancy. I, I questioned whether I remembered it incorrectly, but from what I'm hearing, it is not as vibrant as it used to be, but the one on the space side end is much more vibrant in color. Okay, I, I don't know how much time we have left, but I see uh, Len, Archer, do you still have a question? Oh, I have so many questions. This, I was, know. A, this was such a wonderful presentation. And, I know. and, and as a Tobago boy growing up, um, I, I, I'm from Mount Pleasant. So, um, and the Boku area, and uh, of course, Pigeon Point is, is one of my playgrounds as a young yes. person. Um, there is so much fascination about the, the the sea and the reef and and so on but um to ensure that there's a, a sustainability um it requires obviously government regulation and as you just said some enforcement and also education with the to the public and i i'm so disappointed sometimes with what our, our government governments um really all of them uh, have done or, or, or have not done. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, full disclosure, I went to school with Rowley. So mm -hmm. he was, you know, so we, we know each other um, from bishops um, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I'm not, you know, saying anything personal about him necessarily. I'm talking about the whole government institution, the way we have approached some of these things. Um, we just don't seem to, to either put the regulations in place or, or, or the enforcement necessary. I, I think I, I mentioned here on a, one of the previous presentations when we were talking about coral reefs around the Caribbean. Uh, I remember going to the reef as a little child um, a long time ago, guys. That's just like in the late 50s, the first time I went there and, and repeatedly um, many times after. I have just seen the degradation uh, when I was a, a child and teenager, people used to go to the reef and literally bring back big coral as, as trophies. And you could probably see them in, adorned in their houses. They would bleach them and put them up in the yeah. you know, as decorations. Um, destruction of the reef. And, and uh, every time I go back, most times I go back and, and take friends and, or go with friends, we would visit the reef and, and I'd just be appalled. Uh, by the lack of, of of the flora and fauna that I, I saw when I was a child growing up. So, and of course, people don't understand um, how many years, how many, how many centuries it takes for a reef to really uh, develop. Yep. And so the destruction persists. And, and so there's not, not a whole lot attracted to anyone. I've been to the, to the reef off space site, by the way, um, which is, as you said, um, and fairly deep water, so it's not easily accessible to most people unless you're a scuba diver and so forth. And um, the other, the other little tidbit of my my experience there is, that I'm, I was at one like when I was at UV, I was a botany major. Uh, mm -hmm. I switched to um, uh, microbiology later on in graduate school, um, and, and we did numerous uh, tours, excursions, field trips to. Um, uh, many of the mangrove swamps, uh, Karini, and um, studied a lot of these, uh, of these things. And, and it's so essential for, for, the, for the development. Um, one other point, if I, I give other people an opportunity to talk here, just because I'm, I'm so- um, We hear you, I know. Concerned <laughs> about some of the things. Um, I, I said, I, I grew up in, well, I was born in Mount Pleasant, lived in Canby for a while, uh, of course, went to Bishop. So I, every day I traveled up the Milford Road and along Lambo, where there used to be a lot of uh, sea grapes and some mangrove and so on, they literally destroyed, cut them down. I don't know whose idea that was, but now the sea is encroaching the land. Mm -hmm. Um, the Milford Road was moved, but the old road is now 
very, very close to the sea, to the sea. And whenever you have high, high tide or so, it literally washes up close to the edge of the, of the road. Uh, all of those things require knowledge, which you guys have, and you do a wonderful job of, of trying to educate the public scientifically. But who listens? And that's where I come to the government. Are they really listening? Do they understand the, the devastation that will come to these small islands? Uh, because we don't have much land space and the sea is encroaching, um, not only because of what we do, but because of what the world does. Mm -hmm. and, and who's listening? Who's really listening? That's that's my that's my beef for today. And sorry for being for no, complaining no, no, so much, but no, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's very important though. It's very, yeah. very important. And, 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 and by the way, one other point. I really I've heard about the the uh, the Castaro effort, and I really <laughs> applaud their efforts. And I know Fali probably has some influence there. He's from that region. Right. Um, okay. Also, another bishop's boy, if I might. Um, yes. Just uh, shout a little bit. <laughs> okay, Sharif. <laughs> he was actually on today at uh, Channel Tobago Channel Five mm -hmm. um, on the Rise and Shine, um, you know, morning program. Right. He was actually there in Castara and highlighting some of these things that's happening in Castara. And Farley was interviewed this morning. Hopefully he can be a leader, and, and Castaro can be the, lead, uh, the leader that, yes. that turns to being around. I um, mean, you know, the population trying to understand our survival and our children's survival are based on these kinds of things. Uh, on a small island, we can't escape that. So, so my, my that's, question- That's my platform. That's okay, because my question and, you know, and comment comes based on that as a follow-up. So it sounds like environmental education is at the core of what we should be doing. So my questions are, do we have environmental science in all of our schools and all different levels? Do we have textbooks? Do we have sci environmental clubs? Are, is this part of our, our educational system in Tobago and in Trinidad and in the Caribbean? So let me um let me answer that one. Um, when I started it with Booker Reef Trust, I entered as the environmental education officer, and our beach program was integral in the primary school program, really primary school curriculum, where we were actually part of this school curriculum going in to educate um, our young persons in standard three. Mm -hmm. And out of this, it grew into our vacation program. And now we do have schools basically coming to us. And again, the issue is also resources, our resources, our manpower, and the ability to just go out there and make a difference. <laughs> what, what I would have noticed when I, um, I came back to Booker Reef Trust in 2017, um, there's a little girl on the slide. That's my daughter. Okay. And... I, I almost use her as my little experiment because when I go to any of our field trips, she is there. And I have seen a change in her, meaning from preschool, where she would see the fish, she would know what to do, what not to do, don't drop the litter there. And she would actually tell the older kids, this is something you shouldn't do. And when I look at our education system, I think we start too late. We start trying to make a difference when they are in secondary school or when they seem to be, according to what education says, maybe old enough to reason and understand. But I truly believe that we need to start at the preschool level and inculcate this as something that you live and breathe. So that way, when they get to the policy makers position, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, you're now not going to try and change that way of thinking and that behavior. It's already part of you. So it becomes something that is easier to work with, something that we can actually look forward to. Our education system right now has environmental sciences um, at the sixth form level, which is CAPE. Okay. I do not believe offered at the fifth form level. So at fifth form and CSEC, it's offered as more biology and social studies and integrated science where we touch on it. 
but I truly believe we need to have a greater push for our marine sciences. And we actually live on an island. We are surrounded by water. This is our way of life. But we basically leave it in the background until the way of life becomes really th threatened. And then we try to make a difference. But by this time, enough time has elapsed where it's not really as as um Mr. Archer would have said, who is really listening? Yeah. So the key here is to give our young persons a louder voice to empower them because they are the change that's coming. I'm not saying the, the older generation and us, so we are not um influential, but the younger ones are the ones who are going to be growing up to take our spaces and make a difference. So we have to start building them up and giving them the tools that they need to make that change. Mm -hmm. So I would want to turn to Sharifa, do you have any? Yes, I wanted to say something to piggyback off of what Ms. Kameo was saying, is that it goes to the point of your cabin, the tree when it's cool. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't bend the tree when it's old. And somebody who is studying primary education, it is, it is very necessary that we start training our children from very, very young. Right? Um, and not only training them, being consistent in the all different levels of education when it comes to our environment. Because most times we start something in primary school, it doesn't go over to high school. Mm. Or we start something in high school, but we already miss the window where it becomes ingrained in the students for them to continuously look for it or follow up with it. So having, having these different um, educational concepts brought early in the in, in primary school, even from first year, sometimes in preschool, mm -hmm. and you have a consistent upgrade in the levels of what you're teaching the students based, based on the different information that is required to move forward, it, would it, would necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily work if you start in high school because they're already big. They're done setting their ways. Unfortunately, this new age I them done setting their ways Mm -hmm. Them love the technology. They may want to go out there in the hot sun to be in the beach. They may want to do all them things. Yep. <laughs> so it really comes down to starting them young and being consistent in teaching them, even reteaching them mm -hmm. over and over and ingraining it into them that this is a priority and we must continue to care for our environment have the clubs yeah have the clubs that goes to the different levels have it be a part of the curriculum as mm -hmm. opposed to being something on the wayside that mm -hmm. you could use as an extra to, to occupy time it should be something that is not just a time occupier but something that is um integral in the education on a whole Yep, math, English, environment. Very much so. From Absolutely. The Absolutely. Yep. If I can just jump in and add yes, to the discussion, yes. one of the things that we're doing at the Book Roof Trust, um, we're sort of expanding on the education drive. And like you rightfully said, um, textbooks, Mr. Archer, I'm not sure if you can see this. It is the okay, one, one of the um, the publications that we have at BRT. Okay. So um, it's all um, in a nice, colorful setting for kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we have a number of these. So we're trying to hit, Kelly said, we did primary school. We were successful with the secondary school. And now we're trying to hit the preschool level so we can get them more involved. So mm -hmm. education has become a huge drive at the BRT at this point. So we can really bring home, change the the cultural thinking, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the mindset. Yeah. yeah. So so across the Caribbean, Trinidad, Tobago, um, you're saying that environmental science is only right now 
formally offered in form perhaps form five and form six is that is that the current status um i can speak more confidently for trinidad and tobago but i know that in sixth form in trinidad and tobago we have the cape environmental studies okay right and at the fifth form level it's not an entire subject area that's offered it's offered as a components of integrated science, biology, um, some chemistry. Mm -hmm. So there's no subject being offered at this level for CAPE students, Form 5, mm -hmm. um, that is purely environmental sciences. Mm -hmm. It's only components. I'm not sure what the other Caribbean countries have in existence, but um, a few years ago, that was pre-COVID, one of our schools in Tobago, Scarborough Sec, mm -hmm. they did approach Booker Reef Trust for us to develop a curriculum and help them implement it in school for, I think it was sixth form, and that was marine sciences. They wanted to actually do it in their school. But as usual, we have pushback in terms of the red tape to have the... The, the higher managerial mm -hmm. red tape cut so that it can be something we can implement as even a pilot project. So education and getting that approval is one of the things that we do have to look at in terms of we would normally offer reef tours with the schools, but the, the thinking, and I understand the, the concerns for safety, but the thinking is that we don't want children on the water because something could happen, right? But the reality is we live on an island and our children need to learn to swim. They need to know how to work with the environment and be able to survive in it. So we would have put things in place. We have health and safety regulations. We would have taken primary schools out. We do take secondary school students out and to date I can say very confidently we have never had an issue an incident by the grace of God we have never had that incident and we are hoping to continue to expand and get our division of education on board so that we can actually produce something that is worth our students time and an investment into not only their future, but this is their livelihoods we're actually speaking about, where our kids leave Tobago and go out rather than come back into Tobago and reinvest in Tobago. Mm -hmm. I have lived in Tobago for over, well, about 40 years, and I refuse to leave. I refuse to leave because I love what I see here. I love the fact that my daughter can grow up and actually experience the natural environment and i really believe we need to reinvest in our islands our country in order to make it something that stands out on a map mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anybody else has comments i have lots but i want to make sure everybody is uh, <laughs> getting a i have a lot too but yes. just on a somewhat personal level Mm -hmm. If someone, you, you mentioned the need, um, the, one of the problems uh, that we York, the environment is experiencing is the inefficient planning for coastal development. If there is someone who is interested in, in that sort of coastal development, where do they go to get the information for planning and building in a way that is not detrimental to the environment? Um, so right now in Tobago, I know that uh, the department, I have to make sure I'm saying the right department because they keep changing the names after each um, election. So I know we do have a coastal zone unit and we do have a climate okay. change unit okay. under the Department of Works, Quarries and the environment. Please forgive me if I have the wrong title at that point, but we do have okay. those units okay. that were established that um, they actually contribute to our CSUN and science program 
and give a lot of information as well. So I think there's also a need to highlight that they are there. They are there to serve and they are there to um, bring awareness as well. Yeah. So I think that that would be the two that we can look at for the information that you might be looking at. Mm -hmm. Just okay. to add to that, Kelly, um, Doc, there's also the uh, EMA, the Environmental Management Authority, yeah. that is located in Tobago, and they are also quite active in terms of, you know, getting involved in any sort of activities that might be happening in Tobago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, going back to this, the, the part of the challenge is the way the education system is set up, right? Because it doesn't allow for local schools to really go after and do innovative things because they all kind of have to stick to the state, if you will, mandated curriculum. And so um, if, you, if we want to introduce environmental science or some variation of that at the primary level, it will take decades because you have to go through all of the parliamentary stuff. Isn't that sort of part of the problem too? Is, is that sort of hierarchy, you know? Um, I would say it, it may depend on who is at the helm at this point, because we have had, we have been doing it in the primary schools where we were actually going in during school time and teaching about the coral reefs and the importance of it. But then um, when the administration changes. Here's what I'm, I'm thinking. That's, that's really good that you have been able to do that. But what I'm thinking yeah. is like every school should have as part of their curriculum, whether you guys go in or not, they should have as part of their curriculum, you know, so you are like, you know, um, supplementary to what's going on. We want so, to be a core of the curriculum. Yeah. So it is built into the primary school curriculum, um, again, as components. So what we would have done, we pulled that component and built it up a bit. Mm -hmm. So we would have gone into all the schools at that time, the primary schools in Tobago, and delivered that component of the curriculum as guest lecturers or guest educators coming in. Okay. So they have a fresh okay. face to look at and they have um, new activities to do to actually teach that part of the curriculum. But when administration changes, the agreements you have with the past administrators kind of goes out the window. So where we would have an agreement to put regulations and processes in place to ensure that the field trips are safe and to ensure that the kids are able to go out. When the administration changed, we then have to start all over again to start over with permission. And it's basically going back to square one. So it is a, a, a kind of um, spinning top in mud sometimes, but I think it's worth spinning because uh, we do see changes. We do see different mindsets as our heads keep changing. So we are actually going to be trying to chat. We're going to be having a conversation with our new chief secretary and the secretary for education and the environment as well. So. Let's see if we have any changes taking place here to report. Okay, sounds good. Oh. <laughs> Len? One mute, uh, Yes, um, uh, just a couple of things. Um, question, first of all, who organizes the um, tours at Magdalena? Is that your group that does that? So um, I think the board walk at Magdalena, um, we normally do it upon request. So if a school would like to visit the mangrove, visit the reef or the boardwalk, we organize the tours, we organize the transport and all the paperwork. So all they do is show up. 
we give them a little lecture or a session to introduce them to what they will be seeing. And then we have the practical aspect where we take them out to actually see it. And if it's one, if it's a case where it's more scientific, we do have sessions where we teach them to collect water samples, to check the depth of the water using the Secchi disc and give them that hands-on experience. So yes, we do it as well. But I believe the boardwalk, um, once you get permission, you can visit the boardwalk at Magdalena. And, and this boardwalk was, is that's part of the Magdalena development, right? That's not uh, like Tobago tourism. Is that the boardwalk was, was built and developed mm -hmm. by, by the, the hotel system? I, yes, yes. I think it's um, Tobago plantations. Right. So, Tobago well, plantations. Magdalena Tobago plantations, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, uh, and one other thing, you mentioned earlier in your presentation about some of the very uh, functional aspects of the mangroves, you talked about dyes and so on. Mm -hmm. Is there any attempt to, or uh, currently, uh, uh, any sort of industrialization of that? Um, you know, there, there are so many economical factors that are built in to the system as well um, a, 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 that can be utilized and, and can help provide you know, not just work, but industry, um, economy, uh, money, basically, uh, sustain the economy. Uh, do you, is there anything that, or that it's just, a, just, just an academic presentation that you gave? Um, so this one was just basically academic, but right now in Tobago, to my knowledge, we do not have any activity um, utilizing a mangrove um, apart from more the tourism and educational aspect. Okay. So we would basically take kids to visit the mangrove, but I also know of other um, scuba dive operators, so frontier divers, for example, they do glass bottom tours through the mangrove from the Bonacord Lagoon site. But to say actually utilize the, the resources in there in terms of industry and um, any small or um, businesses or anything like that no i can't say that we have that at the moment mm -hmm. okay well it's um, 11 11. it's been uh, it's been long but it's been worth it um, uh, can i ask can i ask just one more question before you go sure. um i just was looking at your website and i saw several names i'm perhaps familiar with alan richards is he's a is uh, he's a I think I know him. I think we were in school together as well. Um, yes. Yeah, Alan, yeah. OK. okay. So uh, that reminds me, too. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm assuming you and Nadera have contacts with Eric Tobago. I've been trying to get them you know, to be part of this, too. Do you have a direct contact that you can tell me about offline? I have. I can, I can email it to you. Okay. Yeah, I can. We can email that information to you with um, contact numbers, and if you may need us to touch base with them, we can maybe try to facilitate as well. Yep. <laughs> right. And there are there are other NGOs and organizations that, um, if you need, we can also facilitate putting you onto them because we believe that at this point we really need to network and work together to help develop Tobago, help develop our products. So anything we can do to assist on that side, just let us know. Um, I, I have one person. I, uh, this yes. is a formal request to have them all. <laughs> I have one um, suggestion as well. <laughs> I yes. have all. <laughs> I have one suggestion mm -hmm. for Corbin Local Wildlife in Mason Hall. Okay. That's my aunt and uncle. They have a really good product as well. Okay. I'm very, very focused on native animals to Tobago and preserving that aspect of it. Yeah. They have a, I will send you an email with their flyer and probably a, a link to their Facebook page. All right, that sounds good. And, yeah, and I can personally vouch for that because my daughter has been there with me. Um, we live in Mason Hall, so okay. I also encourage persons to visit them. It's really nice and it's a nice experience for a young persons. 
All right. I will make one public promise that when I get to Tobago later this year, and I, I usually go almost every year since COVID, I have, I'm stuck here sort of, but I, I am going to be visiting your office in Plymouth. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and I'd, I'd really like to, that, that, uh, project you just talked about, uh, Sharifa, that's interesting. Uh, that's a place I can take yeah. my grandkids to when I bring them down. Yeah. Yes, it's really good. My cousins and they they have a really good um program. They they when you go there, I even my my sister I gifted my niece a turtle for her birthday many years ago, and it got so big that she couldn't take care of it, and she sent it up by my uncle, and he they have it done it all today it's still there and it's very distinct because it have a crack on its shell they are really um enthusiastic in preserving local yeah. wildlife and bringing back um species that may are uh, may be close to being endangered or extinct from the <laughs> island wonderful. yeah wonderful yeah we're gonna have them all on environmental fridays to help that whole purpose of education environmental science and so on so thanks for all of the contacts don't wait for us to ask you again in person or whatever it is being asked right now in public we want to make those contacts desmond you probably should also include the environmental management offices yeah. there yeah. To, to, to the when you have yeah. Anything highlighting Tobago, that would be that's good. That's right. Thing. Yeah, that's a very good idea. So I can include those contacts for you directly um, via phone and email. All so right. I will do that list and I will send it off for you. All right. right? And, and anybody else that I can think of that will be an asset, um, yeah. I will send that contact for you all as well. Okay, very good. So we need to continue this collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. All right. So thank you so very much, everyone, our presenters, our co-hosts, and um, those of you who are here, our regulars, um, everyone, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, share this episode with many others and um, have more people um, become more aware and educated in this area. Thanks again. And um, we'll see you next week on Environmental Fridays. It is personal, episode 12. Thank you very much. Great Thanks presentation. Enjoyed Thank it. You. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right. Make sure to visit our website at www.theenvironmentalfridays.com.